Good morning, OVC Radio, or afternoon nowadays. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Corey Rosen, and you're listening to The Story Podcast. Today, I have on a super awesome few guests today. But before we get into that, a few announcements. If you like this podcast and what I'm doing, please be sure to like, subscribe, share, follow, all that jazz. Tomorrow, we are having our 100th episode party with a panel Q&A, so be sure to tune in to that. And we have some really big announcements that will be announced on that 100th episode tomorrow. Today, I have on a group known as Hold Fast. What's up, Corey? Hi, What's up? Going? Whether spinning tales of the sea, songs of whiskey, or lessons on love and life, Hold Fast are the backdrop to a rowdy good time. Their versatility carries them across genres from Celtic, po- Celtic punk to Irish folk and to pirate rock. Exiles and mutineers all... Hold fast can get a rebellion started and keep it going in long into the early morning. How are you guys doing today? Great. great. How are you? Doing great. I'm doing good. So tell me, what was the start of this band? What was the start of Hold Fast? Uh, Dave and I have been friends for about a dozen years now. Uh, we actually met starting a reggae band. And um, we were a few years out of the reggae band. He was still kind of in it. Um, and we, he had been listening to a lot of, of Celtic music and Irish folk. Um, I was starting to kind of get into it a little bit as well, um, more toward the, the um, Celtic punk side. Um, and we kind of said, well, we can do this, can't we? And uh, recruited two of our best friends, respectively. And with that four, we started formulating what this band was going to be. So this wasn't your first experience as a band? No, 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 yeah. Cole and I, uh, as he said, we did a reggae band. It was a mix of personalities. It didn't quite work out, so it was short-lived and not notable for any particular reason. But uh, that was not either of our first experiences either. But, yeah, this was the second project that we've, that we've started up together and the one that actually stuck. So then I'm curious, for all three of you, you can answer this individually. Where did that love of music come from? Where did it begin? Cool. Oh, go looking at me first. Well, all right. <laughs> Everyone looks. I don't know. I, you know, I, growing up, you know. I'm, By the way, I'm, who I'm, are I'm, you? Oh, yeah. hi. I'm Buzz. I'm the bass player at Hold Fast. I don't <laughs> share their origin story. He they was not one of the me. original two friends that. No, that no, Cole no. Mentioned. I, I was not one of those four people that formed this band to begin with. But you were the first guy to but, get hired. Yeah, I was. I was the first hire. <laughs> uh, uh, musically, I don't know. I, I, I'm an old guy, so I mean. I was a product of the late eighties, nineties, you know, I, I gravitated towards rock and punk and I don't know, that kind of not angsty songs, but just that faster music, if you will. So I, I greatly enjoyed that and, you know, bringing it up by anywhere from my mother listening to Motown in the, in the car. Cause that's, that's what I grew up on to, my dad listened to Merle Haggard and, uh, you know, then I had an older brother live with us for a while. He was, before he went to college, he was, he's nine years older than I am. So all through the eighties, I was getting, you know, clash and, you know, all kinds of other, all like sorts of influence. Yeah. All kinds of influences through there. And I don't know. And then you picked and up then, a bass guitar. And then I found Weird Al Yankovic and I was like, this is it. Like, this is what we got to do. <laughs> And then, and then through many, many years, you know, started playing bass in seventh grade, you know, because my friend was a drummer and they wanted to do battle of the bands at school. So it's like, yeah, I'll learn to do that and got, got out of that. And I've been in many, many bands, but this is the first band that I've ever had where, you know, you have a crazy idea of, you know, Hey, let's, let's all, you know do a pirate song or something like that. And then, and they're for it. You know, they're like, yes, like, that's good. That's good. Yeah, that, that checks out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. How about you, Dave? Uh, this is where I'm going to eat up the entire hour that you have on the radio. No, I'm going to get comfy. Yeah. All right. If anybody needs to, <laughs> my needs to go and, chair. you know, refill their water glass or something else at the time. No, I, uh, we can go all the way back to, you know, five years old singing in church choirs, but in, mm. Uh, fourth grade, I picked up the violin, played violin through middle school. In fifth grade, I started the trombone and played that actually all the way through college. 
grew up in a town that had a really nice music program at the high school. And so, you know, by the time I got into high school, I was doing all of the musical things that could be done at the school, which at our school was uh, was quite a lot. And His ballet program was phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because if there's one thing I am, it's light on my feet. Yeah. yeah. No, it was, uh, you know, we had a we had a steel drum band with uh, like Caribbean oh. steel drums, so I played the cello pans for for two years. We had all sorts of vocal ensembles that I sang in, played in pit orchestras. You know, conned my way into the percussion section of the symphony because the symphony wasn't very good, so they <laughs> let me sit back there on a uh, on a snare drum. And uh, I so yeah, I guess trombone was my primary instrument. Picked up a bass as well in 10th grade. And that kind of became my primary instrument. So that was the instrument that I played in the reggae band that Cole and I are talking about. I've been a. He finally found the cool instrument to let him play in awesome bands. Yeah. It was the bass guitar. <laughs> yeah. I was a, a bass player first uh, before, uh, before anything else. I went to college for music history on trombone. Uh, so I have a completely useless bachelor's degree <laughs> in, in music. Uh, not to cast dispersions on anybody else in the room who has bachelor's degrees in music. I'm sure yours well, will be much more useful than mine. But <laughs> Don't major in trombone. You don't have to, that's, you don't, that's, you don't that's have to, what we learned. You don't have to answer that, Corey. This is our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, getting out of school as a bass player, you know, the next step was to just start bands. Mm. I was not a good enough trombone player to compete for spots in mm. actual ensembles and make that a, he's, a career. He's, he's lying. He is that good. It's just that, you know, Trombone didn't get the chicks. That's why. <laughs> his bass has, yeah, because you had to go so for the bass player then. That that's that's yeah. the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> so moving out, you know, leaving, leaving the academic structure of music behind. And if I wanted, you know, once you get past school, if you want to be a musician, then you have to figure it out yourself. You have to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And so... Based in a bunch of different bands, some that managed to record and play some shows, many others that didn't. And weaving through all of that was a love of bluegrass music from my dad, listening to, to all that since I was a kid, on top of everything else that I discovered for myself. And bluegrass was what pointed me towards uh, Celtic music and borrowed a mandolin from a friend of mine uh, six or seven years ago and just messed around with that, drawing on my knowledge from violin as a kid. And one thing led to another, and my wife never told me to stop buying musical instruments. So 15 musical instruments later, banjos and bazookis and tin whistles and acoustic guitars and all of that. Just, you know, I've always been more about the learning than about the performing. So this has just been one six-year-long learning opportunity and counting. That's awesome. That leaves us to you. Um, I didn't have any kind of formal education with music or anything. Just a just a love of it that I got from my parents riding around on a Sunday in Pennsylvania. You know, mom and dad passing a bottle of wine, listening to the Beatles and anything else that they were into at the time. And uh, always loved music. Never saw where I fit in it. Never really took a, on some instruments or anything like that. Never had encouragement from anybody to do it really um something that i always was able to do was sit down and write mm. um writing poetry and just stupid things that a you know a 10 year old kid does writing jokes and changing lyrics to songs and all those things that that start whenever you're young <clears throat> as i got a little bit older i started getting into hip-hop music a lot and then i started writing stuff for that and um had a few friends and it was we had we had a couple like little like rec center shows where we got together and that's when I kind of started finding out I could get girls by doing this so <laughs> that was when I wanted to just keep doing it and uh, get into music further and you know everything is for a long time was just all you know trying to figure out things on my own and learn on my own until I met Dave um, when we first started doing the reggae band it was kind of out of me wanting to learn more me wanting to understand music more me wanting to actually learn how to sing because up until that point. You know, rapping ain't quite singing, you know, it's, right. you know, um, and, and just wanting to explore more and do more and be more. 
and he's been instrumental in helping me do that. And this band as a whole has been so supportive of me. Um, please don't ever judge Dave. I'm a terrible student. He's a great teacher. Um, <laughs> but these guys are so supportive of me and my hijinks as far as music is concerned. And any ideas I throw out there, we figure out how to make them work or no, Cole, that's a terrible idea. And we brush it under the carpet and we move on. But they, we, they we preserve don't my dignity. We brush it under the carpet. We'll never let you forget about this. <laughs> they preserve my dignity. <laughs> publicly, publicly. We toss it over in the corner and let it stare at us for the next year. So was it originally your idea for the Hold Fast? Um, it, it sprung out of a conversation that Cole and I had. Uh, it was, you know, we were both in a place where we were musically frustrated. Um, I, af- you know, after that, my previous projects had all petered out. I was, had reached the end of the line in the styles that I was working in. And it wasn't exactly, I mean, when you're in bands, it's kind of like playing the lottery. You got to buy a bunch of tickets. As you know, they're not all going to pay off. Mm -hmm. So as a musician trying to start bands, you're going to have, for every band that, that actually does something, you've had three projects that fell through. So there's really nothing for me to, to just talk to somebody and say, hey, we should start a band. Uh, but Cole had that same idea at the same time. And so then it was one of those conversations where we were both coming in without realizing it, like with the same idea. And so by the end of that conversation, it was like, yeah, obviously this is what we're going to do. By the end of this conversation, you did not actually tell him why it was hold fast. That was the question. No, the question was about the band, right? It was not about the, the band, but okay. we can, we can oh. move to we can move oh. to that question. Oh. Why hold fast? Yeah, why hold fast, Dave? I want to know. I don't know this answer. I'm, He's been holding fast for so long. I have. I've been why. holding fast for the answer to this hold fast question. I'm gonna defer to Cole on that. So, one. so Damn. as we as we were we were figuring out exactly what kind of Celtic band did we want to be. Um, we were listening to a lot of different musicians at the time and, and getting into a lot of people. And uh, one of the people that, that I gravitated toward was The Real Mackenzies. Mm. And uh, The Real Mackenzies have a song called uh, The Best Day Till Tomorrow. And uh, there's a lyric in that song that goes, um, and just when you're thinking it might be your last, throw a lash around the mast, hold fast. Mm. And we grabbed those two words and... Our, our drummer at the time, Michael Parks, was like, yeah, that's 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 perfect. So that's the name we've gone with. And so from that, you have become Irish, Celtic punk rock, pirate band, uh, connoisseurs, I would say. <laughs> I think it's just I think it's just a matter of of what, you know, telling stories like, mm. you know, yeah. we 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 listen to the Dubliners and. And, and uh, make them a Clancy and and all those old folk singers and and really what it all comes down to is sea songs and drinking and and women and what else is there war, war. you know <laughs> you know all those old folk songs and, and really just trying to spin that into the narratives that we do I I'm really big and I, I know the band uh, they're all more uh, concentrating on the music and everything, but, but the words and everything that I'm trying to write, I'm actually trying to tell a story a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that story is like, I hate my job. I don't want to be here. I want to just walk away from everything. I just want to be anonymous in a bar halfway around the world. You know, so most of these songs are are of your own. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. They're metaphors. They're metaphors for just wanting nothing more than adventure and travel and just getting lost in this great big world we have. So, out of all the songs, out of all the adventures you would want to take, what is one that you have yet to? Of of the stories that I've told? Of the stories that you told or the stories that you want to tell? Oh, man. Um, well, I mean, in Three Can Keep a Secret, we talked about burying gold. So, like, I'd like to go find some buried treasure somewhere that we yeah, have. Yeah, that'd be fun. That'd, that would be appreciated. That'd be good. <laughs> I mean, if we're talking metaphors, the one experience that we haven't had as a band is smelling what each of us smell like after five days in a van mm. so you know if that means touring the world to find that out or touring the united states or like getting uh out on the road uh or out on the sea as it were uh i wouldn't mind smelling what buzz smells like <laughs> it's roses baby roses 
<laughs> Actually, that, uh, that reminds me of, of another question that, that I had. You, you had talked previously about um, bands and projects. How do you not get discouraged when a, one project peters out? How do you just... How are you able to continue and say, make a new project? How do you not go it's, back into your regular nine to, nine to five or whatever? Well, oh, well we I mean, all have you, you always oh, right, have right, to right, go right. back to your regular <laughs> nine to five. No, it doesn't always pay those kind of bills. But I, I don't know. You, you, you don't join bands to be successful. You mm. join bands to play music. I mean, when, when, when they asked me, well, when not they, but. When their original guitar player was a friend of mine I worked with at my 9 to 5, which was actually a 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. That was real nice. But uh, when, when he asked me, you know, hey, I got this band, we need a bass player, you know, he, he said, you know, he's, he's like, it's Celtic punk. And I'm like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, punk bass player. I like listen to like Fugazi and The Clash. And, mm-hmm. You know, and it's, I was like, okay, like, I could do something like that, like Dropkick Murphys, and I show up. It is not like Dropkick Murphys. It is, it is not wholly <laughs> different, but it's pretty different, you know. So I, it was, it's quite the difference. But I love playing music, mm. and and there's nothing beats playing music for for, you know, at a live show. Like that's that's the top. You know, I can go in and record stuff, and that's that's fun. You know, that's a fun day. But at the end, you do it to play on stage. So it doesn't matter how many how many bands you have that that peter out you'll always be looking for another band. You know, I I have this band and I have an old man band with, you know, two friends of mine and we just get together and practice and maybe play once or twice a year, you know. And, but it's like you still want to play no matter what. So there's there's weeks where we won't have practice and I'll be itching to just go to practice and play with, you know, other people for a day. I don't know. Dave, tell him how he almost didn't make the band. Yeah. <laughs> tell me. Tell well, me. Uh, Breaking I'll, the band, hold I'll, fast. I'll save that as the punchline to this story. But uh, <laughs> to build on to build on what Buzz is saying, yeah, a lot of time, there, there's always a different reason that a project falls apart. Um, and nine times out of ten, it's either personalities or schedules. Mm. Either the... Either the mix of musicians that you put in the room isn't quite enough to spark that flame for each other, or uh, you know you just get to a point where you go three weeks without practicing, you realize nobody actually cares that much, and therefore that is probably your uh, all you need to know about you know the future of that project. So it's 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 almost never about the music, and so getting a new group of people together. Uh, in a new setting for a new, like just trying something new is always going to be enough to, to make you want to do it again. Uh, The the other part of it, as we said, with the nine to fives is none of us is trying, this is not make or break for anybody. There's no such thing as failure for this band or for any band on our level or in our scene or in our community. I've, I've never felt that a band has failed. I felt that, a band might not have lived up to expectations or done what it could have done, but there's so much that's out of your control that you're never going to, I'm never going to put that on myself personally to say that, that I failed. And so that's never going to discourage me from trying again. Uh, the one place where we did fail though, was we take ourselves seriously enough in the Celtic community. Uh, you know, we're, we're not caricatures, but we, we try to, to respect the culture, and uh, Buzz shows up to his audition with the band uh, wearing his flat cap backwards because he hears, you know, it's a Celtic band, so he's got to wear his flat cap, but he shows up Kangol style. Kangol. It the, was uh, a Kangol flat cap. I just want the, you to know that. I was like, back. all right, I got this. Yeah, <laughs> with the brim in the back. and so we, Sam, Who invited Samuel L. Jackson? <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we play through, you know, we teach him the couple of songs that we had, and we play through them. And, you know, he goes on his merry way and we all uh, have a brief chat about what we thought about the new guy. And I, I straight up said it. I said, you know, he came in here wearing a flat cap backwards. So my vote is no. <laughs> but I was outvoted and six years later, Buzz is still here. That's why I've always seen that hatred in your eyes, Dave. <laughs> I see it now. 
<laughs> He's like, I can't believe you're the guy. <laughs> so what what is it like to dress up or to become hold fast in, in that moment? What what all goes into it? There, I know there's bagpipes sometimes. There's there's accordion sometimes. There's a whole bunch of uh, shenanigans that go on. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's a uh, it's it's it is a show when you get it all together. I mean, a lot of bands you're just coming in, you're bringing your instrument and this and that. But our stage setup, we've gotten pretty good at quickly just trying to get all those pieces on stage and bringing it all down. And then I don't I don't know. It's it's nice to have that array of things on stage that just mixes it up between you know instrument changes for dave and for for john it i don't know it's an it's a joy to have so many different sounds in one set i i i think uh to your question i think um being on stage and being hold fast is is just a different part of myself Mm. and it's not one that i think everybody gets to see of me um I can be kind of quiet around people I don't know. I'm pretty loud around people that do know me. Um, but uh, to be on stage and to have everybody's attention and focus on you and to try to give something to them that you work so hard on, is there's nothing else like it. Did that ever scare you? Uh, as a person who can be quiet around newer people, did that ever scare you to go on stage and let it all loose? So one of the, one of the hardest things about this band has been that we – Er, pretty early on, we decided this is going to be original music. We're not going to be a cover band. We're not going to be a tribute band. We are going to write our own songs and do our own thing. So there was an unbelievable amount of pressure on, at least for me there was, that first year that we got out in front of people and just wondering, like, are people going to like this? Are people going to like everything that we've worked so hard on? And uh, I spent... I spent, uh, to put it uh, gently, I spent a lot of time on uh, self-medication that first year, year and a half, uh, waiting until, like, I felt comfortable enough that, okay, people like this. Okay, we're on to something, you know. Um, okay, people aren't laughing in the corner and pointing. We're okay. So, so yeah, I mean, I felt a lot of pressure. I'm not sure how Dave does as the classically matri- trained musician here <laughs> and the road warrior that he's been for so many years. What what Cole's dancing around is that as long as there's enough whiskey in the room, we'll be fine. That's <laughs> always what it comes down to, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, tell me what it was like when you start when you realized that oh, people actually really like this. What was that moment for you? What what was that? Was there a time that specifically happened, or has that just been, uh, just the general over over time? Oh we're a band and people like this band. I think it started seeing, started seeing regular faces at shows, started seeing people who were making, you know, five or six shows in a a two month period. And that's, I mean, as much as, as we all have friends and things that, that we see to see people who I didn't know Mm. showing up again and again and go, Oh, Somebody likes us objectively, you know, not, oh, this is my friend's band. I want to I want to support them. It's like, no, no, objectively, they are choosing to come back again and again to see shows. And I'm like, that's amazing. Like, that's that doesn't that doesn't happen often with a lot of bands. I mean, I think anybody in a a smaller band will tell you that 50 percent of their shows, if if they got a good crowd, it's probably a lot of people they know, you know, or other band members know or a different band that showed up that has a draw, but people were showing up to our shows to see us, you know, see him with a hold fast shirt on, you know, not the show, not the shirt of the guys who are headlining the night, but us who are playing first or second. Mm-hmm. So that, that for me, that was when I was like, Oh wow, this is, this could actually like work out to something here, you know? Yeah. I think, yeah, what Buzz said, but also um, I remember definitively thinking about the time we put out our first album and we had our we had our album release that night. There were a few people that, that came out that night and they were people that we didn't know that had seen us at different times. And we for us to be having an occasion like an album release and so many people 
took time to come out that night and share that with us. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, and I think uh, one of the one of the things that we hit on, if, you know, we talk about all the reasons that projects don't work out, but a reason that this project did work out that I think we're all keenly aware of and will never forget is that it turns out the Celtic music community is not only pretty tight knit among the musicians, but also the the fans and the the broader community. So we stepped into a genre of music in a local community that is always going to want more, is always going to want to find out what's the next new thing. And in, in that way, there were some guardrails put in place mm-hmm. in the very beginning. If you're an indie rock band or rock band or insert adjective here, rock band, you could spend three years trying to figure out what your sound is. What do you want to sound like? Is this something people actually want to hear? Does this just sound like a ripoff of X, Y, and Z? With Celtic music, if you have a banjo or a mandolin and a bagpiper or an accordion player, so we went out and got all of those. And <laughs> or, you play or, that, or learn to play them. And you play folk melodies. Like, put whatever else you want behind that. There, was, there were those guardrails in place stylistically that made us easily identifiable as a Celtic act. And... I won't say came with a built-in audience because you know we're certainly grateful to the bands that uh, that brought us along and and gave us some of those first opportunities. But yeah, like people liked us, people were willing to listen to us because they're because we we're a new Celtic band, and then mm-hmm. decided that it was something that they wanted to hear again. And we've been trying to s- test the waters and get outside of that because we don't just want to be. Uh, in that box, insert uh, some pretty standard uh, artist rant about you know how right. they want to find their voice and stretch their boundaries. But it's true, <laughs> you know. You, you could probably get that same speech from any musician you ever you ever uh, interview because it's true. Uh, we've we've worked to step outside of that, and we've seen some mixed success. Where our biggest shows are still the Celtic shows, and we're still trying to. Uh, to get our footing as a as a strictly punk band. Did you guys know that community was there uh, before you stepped into it, or was that just a surprise to you? We kind of found out, like, right before. <laughs> like, we were kind of in the planning st- stage of, like, hey, maybe we could try this, maybe we could do this. And then we found out there were a bunch of Celtic bands, and there were a bunch in our area, so... We were pretty naive in that first Yeah, year. yeah. <laughs> That's something, when I, when I first looked up you guys, I was like... There's a whole scene over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. Yeah. So, what is it like to uh, you guys are from Harrisburg? What is it like in the community there and the music scene there, or is it okay just to be playing there, or or do you have to go out to the Tell Us Three Sixty Irish Pub, or do you have to go out to all these different places to uh, perform? Um, I think we're starting to get out and about more. Coming down to Lancaster, we we consider this our second home. We love coming down here. Um, tell us has been so good to us absolutely and but we we are realistically at a point in in, in this band's uh development where we're ready to get on the road and get out there and play in front of more people and find more people that might not have heard of us yet playing in chicago during st patrick's day in front of the green river <laughs> that would be nice yeah all <laughs> <yeah. laughs> of chicago <laughs> coming 2024 so have you guys ever been on tour before? Uh, what is that looking like? Are you planning, starting to plan that? or? I, I think, I don't know, have either of you really gone on a tour in your histories? Like, I, I haven't, you know, most shows I've played with any bands are all, you know, one day's drive. You know, maybe a show mm-hmm. that we have to stay yeah. overnight and drive back the next day, but never really strung together like a tour up the East Coast even or anything like that. It would be nice. It'd be a bucket list idea, so... It'd be be something to definitely check off. To answer Buzz's question, no, uh, I've not been in a band that has that has been out and about, uh, unless you count the IUP Trombone Studio playing at the PMEA conference in uh, Tr- Trombone for the win Hershey, again. I like this playing playing the the PMEA conference in Hershey and making a a few shows on the way out there and back to make it worth driving from Indiana to. Mm. So Grantville and back in a couple of days. That's the closest I've been. But 
we had a tour lined up. We were going to start here, headline the Reno Celtic Festival in Reno, Nevada. Wow. And so we put together the shows that it would take to get out there and to get back. And those that could hop in the van would come along. And those that had to fly out just for Reno were going to do it. That tour was scheduled for May of 2020. That's what I feel. That's mm-hmm. yep. And seems to be so, a trend on the show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was that was our first opportunity, but not the last. Yeah, we've we've actually been getting out uh, to to Buzz's idea. I think most of us have just done, you know, drive and come back. And just this summer, we started getting out of town for the weekend, playing two or three shows, and then coming home. So. Plan on doing that until we do get on a bigger tour. But we've been working on some things, and we got some irons in the fire. And you know, to be to be perfectly honest, we're all we all work nine to fives, and mm. most of us have uh, have kids in the house. And so, you know, life we're not gonna n- none of us is gonna drop drop our lives for three months to to go on a on a 30 show tour and then any you know, record companies backwards. out there listening uh, for the enough right amount of money, we will drop everything. That's and true. Go on tour. That's, that's <laughs> true. We have a price. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you for clarifying buzz. Important. I didn't want Dave. But... I didn't want Dave to ruin it and make them think that he was too uh, <laughs> self-righteous to that. bother taking the money to go on tour. I will, I will do it in a heartbeat. That um, offer has not been made. My yet. wife is pre okayed that she's like, if that happens, you have to do it. And I'm like, yes, I know. I know. So RCA, if you can hear me, <laughs> so what is it like to balance your your nine to fives your your lives with your uh families and still make this work oh boy yeah, for, uh, me, for me that's like doing two jobs this is this is my second job um the you know social media and the digital world just has made things so much easier to do but it also has added so much to your plate because it's it's not enough to just be a musician. You have to be a musician. You have to be a promoter. Like I've made the joke in this band a million times that I, I didn't join this band to be a musician. I joined it to be a t-shirt salesman. Because <laughs> you know, if you hit the merch booth at one of our shows, that helps us more than anything else. Absolutely. Yeah. Because for all bands. For the rest <laughs> of us. Yeah, because, for, for the rest of them. Yeah. I think the answer is incredibly supportive families wives and uh, extended family that have allowed us to spend as much time with each other and not quite as much. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely have to say, like, my, my wife is definitely a rock star. Because they say 9 to 5s. I don't have a 9 to 5. I have 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. I'm still a oh, night wow. shifter forever. So not only is, am I not there all night with my wife and my two kids, but then she gets them all off to school and before I even get home in the morning and then she goes to work all day and you know so yeah it's definitely the support system you have at home like like the fact that these these people are are willing to allow our crazy dreams to happen like you know this is you know oh what's your hobby oh my hobby takes up you know a day or two of practice a week and then also whenever shows are scheduled, so maybe, you know, three days a week I might be gone at some times, you know, four days a week. It's like, oh, I'm busy with the band, sorry. So it, it's the other family you have. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, they just have to deal with it, I guess, and they do great jobs. I don't know, very supportive people. Yes, my wife is likely listening to this, so I'm going to toss in on that as well. She <laughs> has also been a rock star. So then, what do what do you families, or more specifically, what do your kids think of when are they allowed to watch your show, or are they allowed to listen to your music? What do they think? Uh, you, my kids are are eight and well, about to be about to be eight and thirteen, and yeah, they any chance that they get to go to a festival or a show they can go to, like you know, that's not at a bar with a mm-hmm. you know twenty one and over kind of deal. Uh, they enjoy watching it. I mean, I'm, I'll be honest. I've been playing music a long time, and I said my my kids have been going to my shows for a long time, not just with this band, but with other bands. And at certain point, like they appreciate seeing Dad on stage, but sometimes they're like, "Yeah, I've heard this one." So, <laughs> <laughs> Especially the thirteen year old, she's you know 
she's had it sometimes. She's like, yeah, I've heard this song Gosh, before. Dad. Yeah, dad. Ah, <laughs> oh, dad. I don't know what kind of band I'd have to be in for her to just be like, wow, this is amazing. Oh, I know a famous one. If I was in a famous <laughs> band, she would love it. Right. She would love it. Yeah, that's. How about yeah. for you? My daughter's three and. That's the sweet spot. She's, uh, she's a big <laughs> fan. She, it, I mean, however quickly we made it to a thousand plays on Spotify with our most recent record, at least seven of them, seven hundred of them came from our, from our household, from her asking the songs to be played on repeat. Oh, that's cute. Uh, yeah, and she, she knows the words to Cole's songs better than I do. <laughs> it's not my job to know how these songs go. I just have to play them. So if Cole's ever out for whatever reason. Call your daughter up. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah I, I'd, I'd do that. I would do that for at least a show or two. I mean, Dude, that was, that I'd would give her be, a chance, Dave. <laughs> that would be a, sp- a sight to see. I, that you talk about gimmicks. Oh, man. <laughs> Three-year-old singer. You're singing uh, Irish punk rock. <laughs> singing Irish punk rock. <laughs> at, I would, at 120 beats per minute, she is just slamming and jamming. <laughs> give her a tiny uh, bagpipe set. Oh, I would I would yeah. buy her a small leather jacket. <laughs> we would we would get this done. Uh for me, I'm gonna be judicious. I mean, my kids are older and uh no matter no matter how cool I might think I am being in a band, there's nothing that dad can do that's cool. Like I am not cool. So, <laughs> so I said three's that sweet spot where it's like, Oh, this is <laughs> I'm your biggest fan. <laughs> oh, dad, you're the bestest. <laughs> Yeah, the other two members that couldn't be here today that have kids would all say the same thing that Cole just did. Except John. John John just just hates his family. That's that's his thing. I don't know. I don't get it. Love you, John. So how many how many albums or our record or songs have you done so far, do you think? We have we have two albums out right now. Um our first album was um Black Irish Sons. That we did in 2018. 18. I always want to say 17. Um, 2018. And then we just released an album last year, Last of the Rebels. That's our new album. And we're already working on new material for our third album. So, yeah. Uh, that, that, yeah, that second album got a little delayed. Yeah. Uh, it should have <laughs> came out, uh, what, right, right after that Reno tour? We were, yeah. Yeah, we so. were trying to push it through to have it ready for Reno, but we took a step back and it's better for it. You yeah, know, we, we we said, oh, we have time now. So. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. So that's yeah, twenty four tracks so far of, I guess there are of recorded three three traditionals mixed in there. The rest of them yeah. have been originals. Yeah, and for the third album, we're looking at at least a half a dozen originals, and some stuff that's probably not going to make album three. It's probably going to be pushed to album four. So any difference content wise or concept wise or. Oh, yeah, it's more of a Pink Floyd tribute band. Um, oh, wait, no, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> I mean, it, it's all going to be... I've gotten really into digital delays and massive reverbs on my on my mandolin. On the mandolin, yeah, that, that'll be great. <laughs> that would absolutely be great. <laughs> I would love that. Dave often makes fun of me because uh, for my other band, my pedal board is much larger than the one that I bring to, to the Hold Fast shows. Um, he sits there and just makes I'd noise. say yeah, I will sit there and just make noise just during practice. <laughs> well, <laughs> Absolutely. As, as all good musicians should. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean What's a good drummer if he doesn't play during all the silent parts, right? Absolutely. <laughs> anyway. Um uh, yeah, we I think Cole can speak a little more to this, but we've we've gone this way and that a little bit and each individual album has had its own uh specific lane where we're not trying to do the same thing over and over again. Mm. Yeah, I, there's a we definitely are thinking ahead constantly of what we what we want to do and what we want to say and where we want to go and I some of the songs when when we get to an album like I wrote them 3 4 years ago. Oh wow. And sat on them and waited until the time it was time cuz we are independent musicians everything we do has to wait for when we can go to the studio. Um we don't have a we don't have anybody else footing the bill. Um, but, uh, Dave likes to describe our first album as proof of concept Mm. and that's what we did with that. And our second album was us trying to be a little more ambitious and push what we felt Celtic punk could be. And this third album, we're looking to pull back a little bit and 
be a little more charge forward and heavy hitting and and more punk on this next album. Very nice. I'm I'm very excited that you guys are going for album the album route instead of the singles route. I feel like album is a dying art. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's an ongoing conversation and negotiation with the way the winds are blowing and and how that all is going to work together. Yeah. But ultimately, however the the material gets released uh, the first time, we're, we're always thinking in terms of how they fit together as an album. Mm. Good. We, speaking of uh, songs and albums, we have a few songs from your second album, right? Yeah. We have Last of the Rebels. Tell me about it. What's, what's the song about? Um, I tend to I tend to take my ideas off of things that I things that I know or things I experienced or things that I see from in other people. Um, this song I, is a little bit about Michael Parks, our first drummer, and a little bit about myself. And it's it's just about being older, more experienced. Um, you're you're getting to that point where you've had enough of everything, but you still got some fight left. Mm -hmm. And with that said, this is Last of the Rebels by Hold Fast. <laughs> Last of the Rebels by Hold Fast. Tell me, so what is it like for you guys to, so you, 
Is it most of the time you write the song? Um, I write the lyrics. Lyrics. Um, I started playing acoustic guitar right around the time we started, and uh, my play is a bit limited, but I've been using that as uh, to help me flesh out songs a little bit better before I give them to Dave and say, "All right, this is what I got." Because before it was just like, "Hey, here's some words, and where do it does it kind of sound like I'm singing at?" And him trying to correct me, but. I've gotten a little bit better with being able to communicate to him what I want. Yeah, it's uh, it's been a words and music relationship where, like this, Last of the Rebels might be the lone example in, well, I won't say that. Um, either he'll have a set of words and a basic melodic idea, and then I'll sit down and and decide what the chords are going to be and start to flesh out the arrangement. But, you know, the, as, as happens when you get six years of practice at something, you know, Cole's ideas are becoming more and more fully formed when I even hear them. So uh, that's, been, that's been really nice. Uh, Last of the Rebels is an example of a song where I had an idea for a riff or an instrumental melody mm. that I then tossed back at him and said, you know, here's what I, <clears throat> here's what I hear. Uh, that banjo riff at the beginning was the genesis of that song, but the chorus was all Cole. He came back and said, okay, here's what your verses are going to be, and this is what the chorus is. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's, it's not... Buzz's ADD prevents us from just like jamming and coming up with ideas on the spot. Yeah, it's not organic like that. I, <laughs> I can come up with ideas and we get something that sounded great and never be able to reproduce it ever again. <laughs> so yeah, generally generally we'll work on, Cole and I will work on the stuff ahead of time. And you know, the other guys in the band have, have brought us ideas, so we can't claim 100% ownership of everything, but uh, 99%. Another question I have, um, what makes this different than like Appalachia rock? Because you say, you, you mentioned mandolin, banjo, all similar very rock. much instruments to Appalachian. Appalachian is Appalachian rock. Well, Appal Appalachian. You don't know what Appalachian music yeah. is? Well, I know what Appalachian okay. music is. I, okay, I, I, was, I was picturing a genre where... Uh, where, where there was the, electric guitars behind bluegrass? Is right. that what you were just yeah. picturing? Yeah, I that mean, would be heresy. But anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, all Appalachian rock artists out there. Dave thinks it's heresy. <laughs> <laughs> so, this also this answer could also take up all the time you have allotted for uh, to to give you the the full the full dissertation on the roots of Appalachian music in uh, Celtic folk music. But the short version is that all of those old fiddle tunes that bluegrass music is built on, I won't say all, because there's a, a connection between what the uh, Scots-Irish brought with them when they left uh, the Ulster plantations and came to America and ended up settling in the Appalachian region. Mm. They brought uh, their musical traditions with them and... Then they ended up meeting with uh, the African Americans who came over and brought their traditions. And so bluegrass is, you know, at times, at times, some some proportion of those two ideas or those two traditions uh, brought together. And folk music is folk music. You know, there are a lot of commonalities. Uh, you know, I'm sure we could talk for a while about pentatonic scales and, mm -hmm. you know, how they underpin every single melody that you've ever heard in your life. That's right, mm -hmm. yeah. And so it doesn't, you know, the pentatonic scale exists at all four corners of Universal, the world yeah. independently. And so that's the common thread. Uh, and so, you, yeah, you can talk about the historical aspect of where these people came from and how those threads get traced back to, to Ireland and Scotland or music you know there are all those connections that exist so your music history degree has been useful for something aha uh -huh. i've waited an an, an, a, an a undisclosed number of years <laughs> to appear on this part on this podcast and and drop that knowledge on you yeah <laughs> i'm willing to admit how long it's been <laughs> <laughs> so for for your songs 
um, what do you decide gets to be played? What versus not? Because I don't correct me if I'm wrong, but I didn't get to hear any uh, mandolin or fiddle on that piece. Well, I mean, number number one is we don't want to do anything that we can't reproduce mm. on the stage. Well, I, I say that, but we have done a few things with some pianos and stuff that we don't do do live. But, but Buzz, Buzz is right that that was a that was a. Um, I'm tripping up on Buzz is correct. That is something we've actually said out loud to ourselves. Record that. Make sure that was recorded. Yeah. Dave said I was right. But, Go ahead. But yeah, yeah, we, we we don't we don't want to do anything we can't reproduce. And being that certain instruments like you know the the mandolin or the banjo, it's like that's all Dave. Mm. So you know what what reel or what riff does he want to do in that song, and what what instrument does it require? And then and then on top of that, you know when when you're choosing. I mean, John has a choice between accordion or bagpipes, but also Dave has a choice between accordion and bagpipes because he will let John know which one he wants on there if possible. But, it, you know, it depends on what song it is, what the, the feel of the song is. Bagpipes are, are kind of harsh for a laid-back song usually. So so it's generally a more rocking tune if you're going to hear the, the bagpipes in there. It always it always made me upset that uh, Amazing Grace is played with bagpipes and it just, <laughs> <laughs> just destroys the reverence of the song. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I understand. What's that? It's that forgiveness theme again. You got to forgive the bagpiper for for it's that the noise. The whole point, the whole point of it, <laughs> isn't it? It is. So we have another one of these songs, Wild Mountain. Wild Mountain Time. Wild oh. Mountain Time. This is one of our one of the few traditional songs that we cover uh cover is not even the right word we do our own version of it right. just like everybody else has um so yeah this is an example of the three or four that we that we didn't write that we did not write this song but we've we've put our own spin on it as they say that's awesome so what is that uh traditional about this is this song is about a lost love um we actually started playing this back around the time our first album came out. We played this for my aunt. Um, well, we played it. We played it at a benefit for my aunt. My aunt um, was was suffering with cancer, and uh, we played a benefit, and we the, we played an acoustic set. Four of us, the whole band, couldn't make it, and we played this. And she loved this song, and so we continued to play it for her and dedicate it to her. And then we ended up putting it on the next album. Mm. Well, that's it. This is Wild Mountain Time. Arranged by a hold fast. Oh, the summer time is coming. And the trees are sweetly blooming All the wild mountain time Grows around the blooming heather Will ye go, lassie, go I will build my lava tower By a pure and crystal fountain And upon it I will pile all the flowers of the mountain will be gold, I see. If my true love did leave me 
show, man. We can do a little bit. And that was Wild Mountain Time by uh, Range My Hold Fest. Where can people find you? Where Where are you performing next? Where all the good things? Um, our upcoming shows will be at Central Penn's Homecoming next weekend. Uh, we'll be up in Lebanon at Scott Church's The Church on the 21st. And next month we should be back down here in Lancaster for Black Irish Friday at Tell Us 360. And be, so be sure to check them out there. And you have you guys are on websites. and Yeah, uh, you can find us at holdfastband.com. And we're on Instagram and Facebook, all the social media. Um, hold fast Harrisburg, hold fast band. Usually you can find us. So with that said, we're, we're going to uh, get off the radio, but we're going to continue on Facebook Live. If you guys want to follow us there, you can follow us at The Story Corey Rosen on Facebook or anywhere, really. You can follow find me anywhere on the, those, um, just searching that up. So we're going to get you guys back to the music. All right. So, by the way, if anybody watching has any questions they want to ask a Celtic punk rock band, please be sure to do that in the comments and we'll get around to that. The first question I got is, what is one of the best pieces of advice anyone has ever given you? Never promote yourself above your level of competency. (laughs) (laughs) That was listed by the Peter Principal. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I mean, I, that only really works for my working life, not for not for yeah, music. Yeah, we're talking. <laughs> but still, are we uh, talking well, general advice, or are we talking music advice? advice? Well, sometimes general advice, you know, works out for music as well. Just like that, I, I mean, I'd follow that for <laughs> music wise. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I my my fatal flaw as a as a character is that I've been too stubborn to listen to other people when they have good things to tell me, mm. good advice to give me. I've been uh, pretty hard headed and thinking that I can figure it out on my own. So I've learned some hard lessons over the year, but not any advice that anybody's given me. Uh, that's Dave, very Dave demands to do it the hard way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Must learn with all the suffering and pain. I, I just think that I think the most important thing anybody ever told me was to believe in myself because if I don't believe in myself, nobody else will. That's why. Yeah. That's truthfully where where it all starts, and you got to believe in yourself that you can do something. Because um, besides, you don't want that belief to come from. Granted, it, it helps, but nothing changes believing in yourself. Yeah. Right. So, what are some of the funniest things or worst things that ever happened to you guys during a show? Has someone been hit with a bagpipe? Or? All right, we're we're off the we're off the Bible we're College radio. Off right? the Bible College radio. Okay. All all things are good. Oh, you can you can say damn now. <laughs> oh, good. Damn it. Damn it! I can't believe I said damn it earlier. All right. Oh, damn it. Do you want to tell one and then I'll tell one? Do you just want to tell the one? one you like tell? A, no, do you, I know do two you good let ones. me tell that one or you guys tell that ones. one? I don't know if you guys have a shot at that one. Go ahead. Go ahead, Cole. So we were playing. We were playing a show. This was early on. Like first year of the band, and uh, Downey, our original guitarist, uh, he's he's a bit of a wild man. Um, so that, that we get the to the friend, end of the night. We that get was to the, the friend the that got me into this yeah. band. We get to the end of the night, and the booking manager, promoter, you know, we're we're at the last song, and he's like, "Oh, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to the bathroom real quick, and I'm gonna run out." He gets in there, and he gets he gets in the urinal, and he hears us playing in the open the opening chords, and. He senses somebody's in the urinal next to him, and he looks over, and it's the lead guitarist playing guitar uh. and taking a piss <laughs> while we're playing the opening of the last song. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. Classic. So he's playing <laughs> guitar and yeah, he's, he's yeah. At, at the urinal yeah. oh playing guitar. Gosh. Yeah, with a like a wireless. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I think I think actually like we were right by the bathroom and his cord was long enough. Was oh, that what it was? In. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> pretty wireless. <laughs> yeah. You see a cord going off stage. Like, what is that going to? <laughs> yeah, this was this was not a a massive venue. This was Mm-mm. this no, was, it was kinda, small bar, small bar. Kind of bar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so what that, uh, did that promoter have some choice words? Or was it... I don't I don't know what ever happened. Like, I, th- I think he might. We, think we definitely did not return there. I, I know that. Ed, that's for I th- sure. No, I th- I think that helped to add to the aura 
That was definitely <laughs> one of those. The mystique of, of, of the whole story. That's yeah. on brand. That checks out. Yeah. 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 It's, I mean, it's not, um, I was so drunk that one time that I, stories aren't actually as interesting to everybody else listening as they are to the people that were involved. So oh, I'll no. avoid those. There was the time uh, where we had our biggest break yet. We were opening for another huge influence of ours that we've uh, since become friends with, Flatfoot 56. Mm. They came to Harrisburg, and we secured the opening slots. So we're playing uh, the upstairs room at HMAC, having a great time. And during uh, one of our songs, Michael uh, Parks, our original drummer, he would jump out from behind his kit, run over to my mic, put his arm around my shoulder, and sing the first chorus with me, and then get back to the drum kit in time to kick into uh, into his set. He, you know, he's done this a dozen times. That's that's right. the thing. It's part of the stagecraft. And so this night, he's set up in front of the curtain that's drawn to cut off the back half of the stage, which they apparently had uh, filled with a bunch of storage. And so he gets hip checked by something larger than he is Ooh. into Flatfoot's bass rig and topples that on top topples, of Buzz. Topples the bass amp off. In the middle of the, uh, the bass amp is hanging off of the front of the cab by the speaker cable that connects the oh. amp to the cab. And we're trying to get through the rest of this song. There's no bass in it because Buzz has to figure out how he can get a sound out of his instrument after that disaster. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that that wasn't the end of the relationship right then and there with them. It's uh, a miracle. Was I will cool. note they expected us to bring our own back line the last time. We played. <laughs> we're not we're not sharing anymore. Oh. Oh man. Oh, uh, there was a gig we did down down in Lansdale and there was a older couple having a really great time and they were just dancing oh. and and going and all of a sudden this old lady takes a tumble Right into Dave's mic stand, and he gets popped right in the mouth. That song. <laughs> so Dave has been punched in the mouth by an eighty-year-old woman. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I knew Dave. Dave wasn't going to tell any. I was so drunk stories, but I will tell the one <laughs> that shall I forever get retold. And I, I showed up. I once again I worked night shifts, so we had a Saturday afternoon show. I'd gotten off work that morning, went home, took a nap, go to the show. And, of course, pick up beer on the way because, you know, what would you do without beer? So I'm drinking, playing. We're just playing the set, and I just got entirely too hammered. Start stumbling. We're, we're playing in a pavilion down by the creek. And I basically <laughs> just, I'm playing, stumbling backwards out the back of the pavilion, the drummer and the whole band getting farther away until finally, <laughs> wow. <laughs> It was somebody, not the best show we've ever played. Somebody taps me on the shoulder and they go, I think something's wrong with Buzz. <laughs> and I look behind me and he's just laying on the ground. Uh, slow motion backup in the slow motion fall. I can see everything. I remember it to this day. Like, I, uh, yeah. I, I thought that's what you were going for. I didn't realize you had fallen. Yeah, a lot of people thought I was playing. <laughs> so I went down. I'm like, I don't know. And it was that it was later oh, the man. next day that I was like, you know, I didn't eat anything all day, so <laughs> no. I was like, that that was a bad idea, <laughs> bad choices. <laughs> we have a question from an audience member, Sarah Thompson. What is each of you? What is one of your favorite Hold Fast songs? Ooh. Favorite? Oh. Hold on, I have to look them up. I can't Dude, just like favorite. I'm gonna have to pull up Spotify songs. and look at the list of old fast songs. I, you should check them out on Spotify. I, I actually still enjoy Gangway. That is one of my favorites. <laughs> I I think I feel like we played it so many times, and yet it's still one of my more fun songs to play. I, I like the energy in it, and yeah, I, if, I think I think if I was gonna go with the song that I enjoy us playing, not just me, but I, I'm when we're on stage and we're playing Three Can Keep a Secret. I feel like we are like close to our pinnacle. Like we are having fun. It's automatic. It sounds great. Just love it. I'm still looking. He's looking. So I'm there's just... there's the you know. I'm gonna take the the songwriter answer and just the song that I'm most proud of the way it came together, and that is the Aaron Gerbra Suite, which is another tune that is not entirely original but we have certainly done a version of it that nobody 
uh, nobody has ever tried to do before. And with all of the creative ideas that we had that we managed to put uh, down on the record for our second record, that's the one that, like, we were ambitious, and I think we got there. Mm. Yeah, and that and that song it, that encapsulates uh, a couple of different elements. Um, the song "Aaron Go Bra," which is an old uh, IRA tune, uh, written by Dominic Bean and uh, made popular by the Wolf Tones and a few other bands that played it. And then what we did was we dropped an entire rock song into the center of this sweet, somber song about the events of the Easter Rising. And uh, as as an impetus for that section of music, um, I took a poem from Brendan Bean and uh, took his poem, and that's the first verse, and then wrote two other verses for it. And we just rock out and then work our way back to the sweet melody to close. Dave worked really hard on that one. Yes, he did. Yeah, we didn't. We couldn't find a cello <clears throat> player in time uh, to get to the to the final version of that. But, you know, someday for the box set. Someday for the box set. Yeah. Someday for the box set. <laughs> I, Dave should have just bought a cello and learned how to play it quickly. <laughs> I have a cello if you want one. <laughs> See? We know who to call next time. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of uh, Buzz, Heather had this question. When you fell on the ground, were you still playing bass guitar? Uh, it was still making sound. It was still I, making I will say that. <laughs> I, I was, uh, the, whole, the whole way falling backwards, I was playing. He was, and, and I did get up and finish. He was still keeping up with how drunk our drummer was. Yes. <laughs> wow. That's, yeah, it was, it was, yeah. That's yeah. impressive. It was a day. It's definitely a day. <laughs> so what's one of you guys' uh, – this also comes from Heather. What is one of your number one bucket list uh, sh- shows to play or venues to play? Wembley Stadium. Wembley Stadium? Play, play Wembley Stadium. <laughs> we can make that work. Oh, man. I – I'm not sure. This might be an easier question. How about a uh, band to open up for or band to be playing play with? The Dropkick Murphys, right, guys? <laughs> <laughs> right, guys? No. Uh, no. 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 See, the no. funny thing is we, you know, as a local band, we've actually managed to check off quite a few, bo- oh. few bands that we've that we played with and that we've shared a stage with. Uh, you know, Floggy Molly might be, might be there, uh, you know, the next one to cross off the list. As far as shows to play, I would want to play either Red Rocks or a really big show in Philly. Like, I would want to go, uh, well, Penn's Landing, they tore that stage down, but, yeah, I would want to just, if if 5,000 people are going to pay to come see me and I can take that payday home, Sounds like a, it's a good, good night. <laughs> yeah. I would say Flog and Molly. That's who I'd want to play with. They're Flog they're an Molly. amazing band. I've I've seen them over a half dozen times and oh, I'm I, just absolutely blown away by them. And if I could stand back in the wings and watch them do their thing after I just got off the stage, that would be awesome. I think we should all play Coachella. There you go. <laughs> Somehow work that out. Coachella, if you're listening. <laughs> and, and and to the and to the point of Flog and Molly, the big show that we wanna we wanna play that nobody wants to say is the Flog and Molly Cruise. Yeah, mm. so yeah. play the Flog Cruise and Molly Cruise. Fun. <laughs> that, that would sound good. Flog and Molly, if you're listening. <laughs> so, what are some of the mistakes that maybe you have made or you've seen other musicians make in the industry, and how can we curb that for future musicians? Mm. Mm. Um. I, 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 I try I try not to, to I, I can't say that, you know, me, mistakes other musicians make. I mean, I don't know. Stay off of drugs, kids. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that that's, you know, it, musically, maybe, you know, even if I don't agree with a musical choice that somebody's making or a song that somebody wrote that it, it's not it's not wrong. It's not, you know, it's, it's, you know, maybe not for me, but it doesn't mean that it's not for somebody. Yeah. Learning that music is subjective. Yes, Mm. absolutely. I mean, the the only mistakes I make is in conduct, you know, Mm. and you see somebody who just, it gets entirely too drunk or, you know, somebody, yeah, 
somebody who gets, I mean, I, I fell off the back <laughs> of the stage <laughs> and I'm saying this and I'm like, yeah, that that's unprofessional. Yeah. You know, that, that was a step too far. I, it is an or, occupational hazard for our genre. It is. It is. It's a dangerous occupational hazard. Yeah. I, I think, I think a lot of times when I make a mistake, it's, it's a learning experience to course correct. Um, I know sometimes, sometimes we get a little bit ahead of ourselves. So, you know, you get you get invested in an idea or a song, and then you realize oh, this is kind of a bad idea, or it doesn't go the way that you want it to, and then you have to, yeah. all right, let's we, not do that again. You have to be willing to let some things go, yeah, absolutely, yeah. or yeah. start over. And don't be afraid to change a chord or change a lyric just because you it's your baby. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. We we have changed the way we play. You know, slightly play certain songs that we have recorded. You know, mm-hmm. but the mm-hmm. way we play them on stage will be slightly different because we like that better. Mm-hmm. You know, it's always evolving. So, so and you're never gonna play this the same song in the same way twice, anyway. No. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Chuck Berry could do it though. Chuck Berry. Chuck <laughs> Berry do it the same way every time. So say most of his intros are the same thing. <laughs> 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 now, I uh, the mistakes that I made have all been uh, criminal. Thinking, <laughs> thinking, thinking that I already know everything I need to know, mm. and not mention this a little, a little earlier on. You know, not, not understanding that, you know, maybe, maybe you do have something to learn from this other person who has some wisdom they can share with you. And for me, that's a hundred percent an ego thing, of just like if if I did not divine this knowledge through my own experiences and intellect, then clearly it's not valuable to me. Mm. That is just such an exhausting way to live. (laughs) Right, yeah. I I can't tell you how, because I've gone through it too. I don't need, you know, blah, 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 blah. Or it might sound like someone is being condescending to you because you don't know or whatever or it it might seem offensive to you. So oh, I've done this all all before or whatever, but there, you can learn something from anybody or any experience. Um, don't knock somebody because maybe they're telling you stuff that you might already know, but it's the way you act upon that knowledge or you interact with that person in the future, or maybe they had that little tiny little bit that you're going to miss because you're not paying attention to it. Yeah. And it's, it's ironic for me that when it comes to just topics that I'm interested in or information I want to learn, I, I do approach things that way. I will listen to anybody talk about anything mm. because I want to hear their perspective or hear how they describe it. I, I, want to, I, I want to pick up something that I didn't know before that I hadn't thought of before. But when it comes to like, to me having to do something and something that I have ownership in, like my, you can call it a music career. I guess we're Mm -hmm. on a podcast talking about our band. So I have a music career. I have every step of the way wanted to do it the hard way. I just can't apply that same uh, perspective to, to what we do. And it's a struggle. So on that note, Ned, that thanks note. for having us. Yeah, well, I want to end. I, w- I kind of want to. No, we, we should we should keep going. We we really shouldn't end there. <laughs> well, I, I well I have a uh, gangway lined up because it, it was one of your uh, higher energy pieces, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Tell me about uh, tell me about gangway. What what is that about? What's why gangway? I mean that oh, it man. it is it is gangway. It is. I mean the the lyrics say it all. It's gangway because here we come. It is yeah. it is the. Is the battle cry? Yeah, right? yeah. yeah it's the Can battle cry for whole fast. Yeah, about the about the time about the time we were getting this all going, this song I wrote. Um, I, I was I was coming back from the Bahamas. Uh, I was walking down the gangplank to uh, customs, and as I'm going down, you know, I'm the thinking, gangway. You know, gangway, you know, I'm coming down the gangway, you know, and you know, disembarking, and then some of the starting lyrics for that song came to me then, and then. Wrote them down after I got through customs and I could get out my pen and pad and then ran back to Dave and was like, what do you think of this? And we started piecing it together. Uh, I think Michael Parks helped a lot with the structure on this one. Can I, can I tell my, my version of events? 
Sure. Okay. <laughs> Dave's so, perspective. So Cole brings those lyrics to me, but the other thing Cole brings to me is his uh, cheap Casio like Radio Shack keyboard uh, that he had in his apartment uh, for a hot second. And he brings it over to my house one day for a songwriter session. This was really before we even had the band uh, together for full band practices. And he says, hey, I got this, I got this riff. What do you think? And he plugs in the keyboard, sets it on his lap, and, and plunks it out with three fingers on his right hand. <laughs> and just like, I will always remember that scene of Cole sitting there on the ottoman in the front room of my house and with the keyboard on his lap and plunking that out going, what do you, what do you think of that? What do you think of that? Did we'll he turn that. on, did he turn on the digital drum beat behind it? Is no. that the eventual <laughs> chords for that? that we so, used? so the, the end of the story, it's not, you know, I'm not trying to dunk on Cole. The end of the story, <laughs> I think, Post I think ride. this is arguably the catchiest groove slash riff that we have. There's a reason this song is so popular. So like as, <laughs> as funny as I find that whole story, like, uh, yeah, it's an awesome story. <laughs> It's an awesome tune. I, I just picture that. But that's what this is. Gangway by Holdfast. And that was Gangway by Hold Fast. That is what a headbanger that was. Absolutely. So <laughs> yeah. I have I have a few other questions. Um, someone someone wants to ask Ben these questions. Uh, so what color underwear do you wear on Tuesdays? I would assume gray or black, so I can see only two colors I own. That's fair enough. What brand? Probably Hanes. <laughs> Anybody want to check? I mean. <laughs> so we'll be right back after this short message where he, while he checks his underwear. 
so what's your, also your favorite brand of malt liquor? Malt liquor? What, Mickey's? <laughs> <laughs> if I have to choose malt liquor, I'm choosing mix. Green grenades, guys. I don't need the whole 40. <laughs> Gets warm by the end. <laughs> not not my way to go. The green grenades. That's that's the the choice. And then the final question. If you could steal a car, why would it be Anton Velkin's Jeep the day before he died? <laughs> I I think for a fantastic journey. That's why. <laughs> that that sounds like a Jason Bourne kind of like day. So I, I think I would go for that. <laughs> we were talking a little bit about Appalachian Rock and the ridiculousness of that. And a comment from Joseph Kramer came up and said that would be the Grateful Dead. Yeah, I, I wanted to make sure that we addressed that so that uh, it didn't go it didn't go un, unnoticed. Um, I still stand by my statement that the Grateful Dead is heresy. <laughs> oh. so. Dave, guess what we're listening to the entire way home? <laughs> I, you know, for all... For all of that uh, that they're famous for, I haven't heard a single Grateful Dead song. They're uh, wow. You you I've go play. Along. Go I, play. Go play. Friend of the Devil for yourself. Yeah, I, I I've had a couple of Grateful Dead tunes that I've played in other bands that have been fun to play, mm. but never have I had the urge to just sit yes. down in there and and listen to some Grateful Dead. Dave does not deny that individually the Grateful Dead are great musicians. Yes. I, he I just agree. does not appreciate the music. I like a few Dead songs, but I've just never had the urge. No disrespect, Buzz, to listen bro, to a twelve-minute bass solo. I, just, I understand. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I understand that you, that you grew up uh, that you grew up on blunts, not joints. I, I get it. <laughs> I get it. I totally understand. So, uh, last thing uh, that I have, at least, there's something Monday g- coming to happen. Oh uh, yeah. So check all our social media uh, tomorrow around noon. We're going to be making a big announcement of something coming up for November. We're not going to tell you yet. But no, we it's a wait. secret. Absolute secret. Shh, secret. So make sure you do follow them on Facebook, Instagram, their website, everywhere that they are. They're on also on Bandcamp and, and Spotify and all these other, other places where you can stream music. Hold Fast Band is the tag for most of them. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. Or Hold Fast Harrisburg. Or Hold mm-hmm. Fast Harrisburg. That's what they're based out of. So those in Harrisburg, please be sure to go out and check them they are awesome Celtic rock band. If you want to check out the story, look up anywhere. The story, Corey Rosen, C-O-R-Y-R-O-S-E-N. C-O-R-Y-R-O-S-E-N. It'd be great if I could pronounce and spell my own name. <laughs> one day. One, one day, day I'll get there. I'll get there one you day. get it. Um, tomorrow we have our 100th episode coming out with some big major announcements coming out. At that time, we have our... Well, I'll save that for tomorrow then. Um, upcoming, we, we're we going to take a little bit of a break uh, because we, I need to do a lot of reforming on the podcast. That's something I've learned over this. I, there's a lot of things I'm doing wrong and I need to fix them, uh, such as <laughs> most people realize when they don't know what they're doing. Um, so stay tuned for tomorrow if you want to check out that episode. Otherwise... The single reviews and the album reviews will be going on. I don't think I told you guys about this. Uh, so a single or album review is where a local band or uh, just you know solo musician can put in their music to be reviewed, rated, and we'll get you guys reviews and rates on uh, iTunes. Uh, if iTunes is still a thing, Apple Music, I guess it is now. Uh, Spotify, Facebook, whatever, all that jazz. Those will be coming out over this breakage of interviews so the second one comes out tonight at seven o'clock so stay tuned for that with all that said i hope you guys have a wonderful rest of the day you guys have anything else to say thanks for yeah thanks, hey, thanks for having us thank you guys so much for coming on we'll see you guys later bye bye, bye.